Hello, I'm Roddy Herzberg. I teach physics at the University of Liverpool and my speciality is nuclear physics. I have worked in academic nuclear research ever since I finished my PhD from the University of Cologne in Germany in 1995. The past 22 years I have been in Liverpool, which by sheer coincidence is twinned with my home city of Cologne. You have learned about nuclear and radioactive decay in school, so I thought it might be interesting to show some of the ways a scientist would use alpha decay and beta decay in unusual ways. At the end, I will point you to the NUPEX website where you can find a lot of extra material and much more on the many, many applications of radioactive decay in everybody's daily life. What I want to show you is how we can use radioactivity to first create new and very heavy chemical elements in the laboratory using beta decay, and then how we can use alpha decay to identify what it is we have created in the first place. So here's the periodic table of elements going back to Dmitry Mendeleev in the late 19th century. You may be more familiar with today's way of presenting the periodic table, which lists all the elements known at the time. Today, we have discovered all the elements in the first seven rows of the periodic table, and it looks like this, with the four most recent discoveries at the end. These are elements 113, Nihonium, 115, Moscovium, 117, Tennessee, and 118, Organesson. At the heart of each atom is the atomic nucleus. It was discovered by Ernest Rutherford in 1909 using a famous experiment named after him. The nucleus is made up of positively charged protons and electrically charged neutral neutrons, while the negatively charged electrons occupy the vast majority of the atomic volume. By comparison, the nucleus is 15 orders of magnitude smaller than the atom, yet it's very important. It is the number of protons in the nucleus that determines the chemical element it belongs to. So if you have an element with, say, 92 protons, uranium, one way of creating a heavier element with 93 protons would be to somehow change one of the neutrons in the nucleus into a proton. And such a way exists, it's beta decay. In beta decay, one neutron spontaneously changes into a proton. In order to preserve the total charge in the universe, this cannot just happen by itself. If you have no electric charge before the decay, and remember the neutron was electrically neutral, then we also cannot have a net charge afterwards. So if we want to have that positively charged proton, we must simultaneously emit a negatively charged electron. That way, the total charge is conserved. Charge is not the only thing that is conserved, though. Angular momentum also needs to be conserved, which requires that during beta decay, there's also an antineutrino emitted. So let us now create a new element this way. Take an atom of uranium-238. This is an almost stable isotope. It decays via alpha decay with a half-life of four and a half billion years, comparable to the age of our planet. It is not going to do us the failure and just beta decay to Neptunium on its own. But if we expose it to neutrons, for example, in a nuclear reactor, then we form the isotope uranium-239, which has a half-life of 23 and a half minutes before it goes the right thing and beta decays to an isotope Neptunium-239. Neptunium has 93 protons, so we have achieved what we were aiming to do. And now we can continue this process. Adding neutrons followed by beta decay. Sometimes two or more neutrons can be added together before the nucleus has time for beta decay, so we can climb higher and higher. This turns out to be a big version of snakes and ladders, though, as some isotopes will start to do alpha decay, which reduces the element number by two. This process ends when we have reached element 100, fermium, named after the famous physicist Enrico Fermi. So if we want to put together heavier elements, then we need to do it differently. This illustration is by Georgi Flerov, a Russian scientist working on the creation of new elements in the last century. It shows 
that if a neutron capture is no longer sufficient, one may be able to add more protons by fusing two nuclei together, giving a potentially much larger number of protons. Now that poses a problem because you are now making these atoms one at a time in a particle accelerator and you need to be able to identify what you have actually created. And this is where alpha decay comes in. In alpha decay, you emit two protons and new, two neutrons at the same time in the form of a helium-4 nucleus. This lowers the mass by four and the atomic charge by two. What is interesting is that the energy of the emitted alpha particle is highly characteristic of the decaying isotope. The same is true for the half-life. So when we observe an alpha decay with this specific energy, after a time compatible with a known half-life, it acts as a very unique fingerprint for the decaying isotope. And that allows us to identify the created elements. As an example, I will show you the decays of 10 individual atoms of Darmstadtium, element 110. These form decay chains. When the first one decays, the remaining nucleons form another nucleus. We call the first nucleus in the chain the mother, the next one is the daughter, then the granddaughter, and so on. In this case, we see five separate alpha decays in each chain, one after the other, each one with a characteristic energy, shown here on the right, and a characteristic time, shown here on the left. Now, I know from previous experiments the last two steps in the chain. One is an alpha decay with 8.8 .8 MeV energy and a half-life of three seconds, characteristic of Rutherfordium-259. The last one is an alpha decay of energy 8 MeV and a half-life of 3.1 minutes, characteristic of 255 nobelium. Haha! <laughs> so I can now follow that chain back to the top all the time, simply keeping track how many protons and neutrons have been lost. I start at the bottom end with fermium-251, 100 protons, 151 neutrons, and then I go back up with five alpha decays, each one changing proton and neutron number by two. Then I arrive at the top, knowing that there have to have been 110 protons and 161 neutrons to begin with, giving me the isotope 271 Darmstadtium. That is how you prove to the world and the scientific community that you have created element 110 Darmstadtium. I have used Darmstadtium as an illustration here. The data I show was gathered by a Japanese research group after Darmstadtium had been discovered in Germany. However, many years later, they discovered their own element, element 113, Nihonium, named after Japan, where the laboratory was that created it. And the scientist leading that team has a really good day in this picture. This brings me to the end. I hope I have been able to show you an exotic way in which radioactive decay is used in the quest for finding all possible chemical elements. Radioactive decay is a fantastic tool that is used in all areas of modern life, from basic science to medical diagnostic tools, from therapy to food safety, the possibilities are endless. If you want to learn more about this, one good starting point is the NUPEX website full of information here. And I hope you have found this interesting. Have a nice day. Goodbye.